Hey, Corona TV viewers, this is Peter Keyes from Leonard Skinner. I want to wish you all a happy birthday. First of all, let's just do the elbow bump because we can't do the handshake right now. Hello, everybody on Corona TV. This is Macy Gray. You're smiling and I, and I saw your beautiful daughter earlier who I said could come on the show anytime. Welcome, Shiv Singh. Uh, thank you for having me, Joseph. Uh, great to be with you. Let's do this, guys. Welcome, everybody. It is Fry Yay. Uh, as opposed to one day, someday, whatever, it's Fry Yay. We're happy that it's the end of the week, or maybe it's the beginning of next week. We're not really sure. Um, but boy, oh boy, do I have a treat for you. Um, I have Dr. Dean Allen, uh, who is, uh, he, he's not a doctor like, like the President of the United States is a doctor. He's a different kind of doctor. He's a historian, he's an author, um, he's a teacher, he's a pretty smart guy, and he's going to be talking to us um, about um, the Spanish flu, not the 1917 flu, but the 1918 flu, and what we can learn from history. You know, the, the old saying that we are, uh, if we don't learn from our past, we are doomed uh, to repeat it, and especially the mistakes from the past as well. So I'm excited uh, to talk to him, and we're going to get to him very soon. Little bits of preamble for you, if you will. Um, got some advice about some of the starting credits. Uh, I went and recut them. I lowered the volume, so let me know if you heard the volume being lowered. I hope you did. Um, trying to learn all the time uh, and get better all the time. This has become my my art and my craft uh, and my commitment to you guys um, every single day. Um, so we've got a couple of hellos over here. We've got uh, Crystal, welcome back. Crystal, one of my regulars. Uh, happy day to you too. Uh, Joey Dumont has come back. He uh, he uh, deserted me yesterday. He went to another webinar. Why would you do that? Uh, along with Jan, both of them went and actually uh, left me, but Bob was still with me. So hashtag fry yay as well. And of course, in case you were wondering, it's becoming a bit of a staple. My mother is watching. She's my biggest fan, and she is watching. So from now on, uh, Bob, uh, you've been replaced uh, with with uh, my mother. Uh, who else is watching? Uh, we've got uh, Bianca from Cape Town. Uh, we've got Glennis uh, from Cape Town as well. We've got a very strong uh, Cape Townian uh, contingent. We've got Mella from Durban. I guess, uh, let me tell you something about Dr. Dean uh, Allen. I think he might be a marketer. Uh, because he's been doing uh, a lot of uh, a lot of marketing. I like that. This is what I want for my guests. I want my guests to help. I mean, we're growing something special. We're building a community. Our after show afterwards is like an after party. And sometimes it's like a bit of therapy, but it's all part of this commitment that we actually make to each other. I might be the person talking to you now, but really your comments and your engagement and your feedback and your enthusiasm is what makes me want to continue doing it. So I just want to say thank you to you guys and how much I appreciate you guys. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, um, we have got uh, Dr. Dean Allen in the house, and I'm going to move over to him uh, in just a brief moment. Uh, but as always, we've got a little bit of uh, housekeeping to do. Uh, first of all, let me tell you about next week's interviews. First, we're now almost fully booked into the first week of June. I'm a little reluctant to be filling up too far in advance. Why? For two reasons. One is at some point, I think we're going to be out. I mean, I think we all want to be out the house or the apartment. And so what will happen when people go back to work? Um, I think the timing, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I think doing this Monday through Friday should enable all of us still to be able to commit to this, to, for me to host, for my guests to be on, and for you guys to watch. But next week, we've got Carla Johnson. Uh, I had the pleasure of keynoting with Carla in, in Brussels a couple of years ago. Uh, Cece Chapman, if you don't know Cece, you are one of the uh, unfortunate ones. He is uh, one of the pioneers uh, of the digital and social space. Uh, he's a teacher and he's an all-around good guy, uh, as is Aaron Strout. I had the pleasure of working with Aaron uh, in the past. Um, Jason Burnham and I are going to be discussing... Um, the rebranding or the repositioning of Brand America uh, following my article about the death of America. We will talk about life 
liberty and the pursuit of happiness and how well America, in fact, is scoring on those three counts. And then on Friday, I'm not really sure if it's a real person, uh, but of course there is a person behind the incredible uh, cartoon, the marketoonist, uh, Tom Fishburne is gonna be here and I uh, can't wait to meet him and talk to him as well. Uh, quick birthday list, uh, we've got Seth Shapiro, we've got Brittany Howard, uh, Shimon, my cousin in Israel, Grace, Julie, Kelly, Mike, Frank, David Usher, uh, an amazing Canadian mu musician, Rachel and Larry Kramer, or Kramer, Kramer, uh, David Kramer, Larry Kramer. Uh, so happy birthday to all of you guys. Um, and then, you know, uh, I didn't want to show you numbers today. Um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to show you uh, one number, just, just one number. Uh, and that number is, is 50,000, 50,000. That's unfortunately, unfortunately, how many deaths have been registered in the US. It's, it's um, I don't really know what to say. I don't really know what to tell you. Um, I think the only thing at a time like this um, is to uh, just have a moment silence. And if you will just indulge me 10 seconds of silence, just to think about each and every one of these 50,000 souls that have left before their time, and of course, everyone around the world, it's not just here in the US. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate uh, you being here with me um, and thinking about these, these, these trying times. Um, but we need to figure out a way to get through them. Uh, and that's why I have Dr. Dean Allen on the show with me um, to talk about what we can learn from the past, as I said earlier, to make sure, and, and in some cases I feel like we are making some of those mistakes again. Um, but education uh, is knowledge and knowledge is power. And the power that we need right now um, is the ability to make sure that we are talking about the facts and nothing but the facts. Um, so without further ado, let me bring him uh, on all the way from the wilderness, the wilderness. Where is the wilderness in the world? Welcome to the show, by the way. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you for having me. So it's a lovely, lovely evening here in South Africa along the garden route. That's where I am. All right, but you, you know, so I have I have been in the US for 23 years and I will be in a business meeting and, and some smart ass will basically turn around and say, is that a Staten Island accent? Or you don't sound like one of us. And I say, no, I'm South African. Well, well, now I get to say to you, you don't sound like a South African. What are you doing in South Africa? Well, certainly not. I haven't got a South African accent. I mean, would you believe I've been here on and off since the 1990s? And this accent you can pick up is, uh, I'm proud to say, from the West Country of England. I was born in a little village in, in Somerset there. And um, I first arrived in South Africa in the 1990s and fell in love with the country. But the accent stays with me. And, and so talk a little bit about your journey. You know, what, what brought you to South Africa and, uh, and kind of, and, and, and your career and, and how you come to be here today with me on Corona TV. Well, first of all, can I say happy Friday to everybody? Um, with these, uh, these are unusual times and what you're doing, Joseph, is tremendous. I mean, you're connecting people from around the world tonight. So it's an absolute privilege to be here and thank you for the invitation. Um, no. Yeah, I, I pinch myself sometimes. I'm the first person in my whole family to go to university. Um, I met somebody. I think uh, we all meet people in our life at a certain time. I was going nowhere in my mid twenties. I was working in an office. I was fed up with life, and I met I met a South African lady. Her name was Vanda Merva. She was a dentist working in uh, in the UK there, and she said to me, "Why don't you go to university?" And uh, I did. I, I left the security of a job in my mid twenties. And then she brought me to South Africa and I just fell in love with the country. And uh, unfortunately, that love affair with her um, fizzled out, but uh, I'm still here in love with the country. I went to um, Stellenbosch University. I did a master's degree and then a PhD. Um, and as I said, I mean, I, I absolutely love teaching. I love telling stories and, uh, and to be able to, to make a little bit of a difference and to make a contribution as we're doing tonight is an absolute privilege. And, and of course, we were connected through, and he's watching right now, uh, Andre Dutoy. 
uh, the big positive guy from Cape Town, um, you were hosting a webinar that talk about being a connector. Uh, Andre is a connector, building community as well. Um, I was in South Africa not so long ago. Um, I was interviewed by him on Smile FM on the radio, um, you know, and it's been an, an amazing relationship that we're building as well. And you gave this just incredible webinar. I'm still thinking about it and blown away uh, by it as well. Um, talking about, you know, um, these, these lessons, right? Um, talking about the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic and what we can learn from history. Um, and we're going to get into that uh, in a moment. I just want to say like, to people that are um, um, watching right now, um, we're going to try and get to some of your questions as well. So, you know, Bob, I think he's talking about the second wave. Well, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about yeah. um, whether we expect and should expect a second wave or a third wave. And I know Adam left a comment earlier uh, wondering how the Spanish flu spread around the world so quickly and so devastatingly. Um, he's guessing that soldiers played a huge role in this, and I think he might actually be guessing right. So I think I would like to just turn it over uh, to you, Dean, um, and, and talk about, uh, set the context, right? Why, why are we talking about the Spanish flu and not another, and not Ebola or not some other, you know, uh, the Black Plague, et cetera? What is it about the Spanish flu that should get our attention in context of others that have been, you know, in the past? Well, as, as you said, Joseph, in your introduction, I think if we don't uh, learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. And I think history is, an, um, is giving us incredible lessons now and indicators of what we should do in the current situation. You mentioned Andre de Toy. Andre is a great friend of mine down there in Cape Town. And um, through, through his network, we've managed to build this presentation that we've taken um, we've taken around the world, actually. I spoke to a group in Pakistan this week. People are looking for information, clear information, and what we can actually learn from the past. And as you rightly said, I mean, when I, when I put this um, information together, um, I'm a, as you know, I'm a historian of social sciences. I look at sport primarily, but this is something that really fascinated me. I feel like, felt I could really make a difference here. So what I did with this first screen, as you can see, is I looked at those global pandemics that have happened throughout history. But where do you start? But if you look at the first one there, the Great Plague of London or the Black Death, I mean, it, we're going back to 1334. And it actually, but there's comparisons even then. If we look there, it actually began in China, like the current coronavirus. And it actually was caused by the spread of people moving around the world. It, um, in that particular case, it was the Silk Route. So merchants returning from the Far East actually inadvertently brought this plague back to, back to Western, Western Europe. I mean, there were 25 million deaths in Europe and 125 million people died just from the Great Plague. But listen to this, that lasted for 30 years. I mean, 30 years, it's mind boggling when you think about it. And then later I looked at something like the smallpox. I'm sure you've all heard of that. Um, again, it was brought through people traveling through continents, then by explorers going to Southern America in the, in the region we know as Mexico now. That, that, that virus that they took killed 25% of the native population. And if we fast forward another 100 years, we can see that European settlers took the smallpox to North America and 20% of the native population were wiped out by that. So we can see that it's this movement of people that has caused these great pandemics in the past. And that's where we can where we can look at comparisons today. And of course, we're now at 1918, 100 years ago, and, and we can see the same kind of dynamic. Now, I want to, uh, you know, obviously, uh, it's very important at this point when talking about the Spanish flu. And by the way, for people that are watching right now, um, you're in luck if you want the full expanded version of this magnificent uh, presentation because, uh, Dean, you're going to be giving, um, I actually created a little uh, bit.ly for you. You can see just to make the URL a little bit easier. But if you go to bit.ly, that's bit.ly slash Dean Allen, you can actually register for, uh, for uh, a reprise, uh, an encore presentation, which I believe is going to be uh, on Monday, right? Um, yeah. So I just so want to... Gonna, we're going to run... Yeah. So no. yeah, run the full presentation on Monday at... Um, 4 p.m. South Africa time. So I believe that is 10, 10 a.m. 
um, EST and Great Britain is an hour behind here. So we've kind of tried to do it so a lot of people from around the world can see this. But we were absolutely inundated when the last time we gave this talk, um, we only had the, the smaller version of Zoom and uh, inadvertently we had over 200 people register and it would only allow 100 in. So we've now invested into the Zoom professional so we can have up to 300 people. So please join us on Monday and then we can go into real detail. And, and, and then we'll have Andre joining me and he can talk about the economic impact as well that this will cause. And, uh, and Bob, I just want to thank him. He's gone ahead and, and also re, um, just printed that uh, bit.ly into the uh, comment stream. So you will have that and we will remind you again. Okay, so now let's talk about the Spanish flu because of course the Spanish flu was not uh, synonymous. I mean, it's become synonymous with Spain, but the reality is, and people might be shocked and surprised to find out that in fact, where did it originate? But the good old US of A, and specifically yeah, incredible. You know, yeah, and 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 I think you're going to talk yeah. about it now, which is which is you know travel. Without a doubt, yes. I mean, people. I'll, I will get to why it was called the Spanish flu in a minute, if I may. But we've got to put this in context. When this pandemic broke out, the world had been at war for four years. It was called the Great War for a reason. Nine million soldiers had lost their life. Twenty one million soldiers were wounded. And of course, with the great um, movement of refugees and the movement of people that was caused by this conflict, it was going to inadvertently spread the greatest natural disaster the world had ever seen. Um, you saw from my previous slide, um, over the two years that this pandemic took hold, the, the conservative estimate of the Spanish flu was a death rate of 50 million people. But scientists now are arguing that it could be up to 100 million people. But where did it start? It actually started there in America. Trump cannot call this the, could, couldn't have called this the Chinese virus because it started in a military camp, would you believe, here, as you can see, on the 4th of March, 1918, in a place called Funston, Camp Funston in Kansas. Now, th this was the first recorded case. Now, the soldiers that were preparing to leave for Europe in those last few months of the war were developing flu-like symptoms, you know, fevers, headaches, uh, respiratory, uh, uh, respiratory problems, etc. But before they realized how serious this actually was, this was no ordinary flu, those soldiers, a lot of them had already left for Europe and inadvertently spread this incredible virus with them. And that's how this emerged. So now we're looking at the spread of the coronavirus through travel and people moving between provinces. Then it was the war that caused this inadvertently, the spread of people on a mass scale. Now, now one of the most important things that we're dealing with is this idea of coming out of it and opening up the economy. It's important to talk about it because today in Georgia, here in the US, um, the governor has decided to uh, allow people to get tattoos and, and get their nails done and get their hair cut, uh, et cetera. And I thought, it, I thought it would be really important if you would talk a little bit about what happened uh, with the Spanish flu here in the U.S. with respect to uh, opening up the, the states and the economy prematurely. And I think you have a couple of examples to talk about. Yes, Joseph, I have clear examples of this. The one thing that was, we must learn from the past, and certainly the, the events of 1918, is patience. If we come out of this lockdown, if we come out of this period of self-isolation and quarantine too early, we will, we will effectively not kill this disease early. In fact, we can see, we'll talk about the second and the third wave that we experienced there that we're, that we're susceptible to today. If you look on the screen, that's a wonderful picture there during my research. These are police officers on the streets of Seattle. As you can see, they're using makeshift masks, as many of us do today. Um, but we can look at how it was actually handled. By the time that the authorities realized that this was being spread by the soldiers, of course, the civilian population were being affected. Now, I should say right at the start, the Spanish flu is, is, was different than what is happening today. You could actually die from the Spanish flu within 24 hours of seeing the first symptoms. Can you imagine that? So it was quite a gruesome, a gruesome um, pandemic. So civil society was struck with some form of panic, but it was left to the individual cities to actually deal with it as they would. In a bit of the same way that Trump has now said to the different states, well, it's your decision. Perhaps that is, uh, that is not a very good, uh, a very wise move. 
you were you were talking about how different cities handled it. Well, I can give you the example there of Seattle, which they they did. They they handled it quite well. In fact, they banned the homecoming parade after the First World War. Unlike a place like Philadelphia, which didn't. Now, Philadelphia allowed the homecoming parade to take place. And within two weeks of that happening, 14,000 people had lost their lives. So this idea that you can just allow people to go back into big groups certainly is not a wise one. And we should learn from history. And as you can see from here on this on this current slide, we are looking at different spikes back in 1918 and 19. We also use graphs exactly as we're doing today. And some states and some cities and some countries learned that the longer they, they maintained this discipline and self-isolation, they were able to level this graph out. Whereas places, as I said, like Philadelphia, which didn't heed the warnings, they had a second spike because people returned to normality. And we can see from the headlines, public places are closed. So we're relying on the media, then the written word in newspapers, but today our TV, our internet, presentations like this to inform us. So it really, it really does pay us to look back at differences and different scenarios to learn what is best today. I mean, I, I, I have the chills when I think about the fact that we're making the same mistake. And, you know, look, I, I come in as a South African, an ex-South African, a dual citizen, if you will. Uh, I'm an American citizen. Um, and, and, but obviously I come in as a bit of a foreigner, not born here. And with that comes a different perspective. A certain objectivity, uh, maybe an ignorant, maybe a bit of an ignorant perspective. But I look at this and I think, wait a second, maybe I don't know the history and the intricacies of uh, understanding how the states came together and certain independence and autonomy. But I'm just looking at, at an insanity of at a local level, at a mayoral level, at a state level, from a governor standpoint, and at a federal level. And I think, why can we not just figure out? one solution, one clear way and path forward. It doesn't have to be a, a dictatorship, but I mean, I, I'm looking at South Africa and I'm looking at the leadership from President Ramaphosa, and I'm thinking that whether in fact it is one man and one voice or one woman and one voice, because I think several of the countries that are leading right now are being run by women. The fact is what we need is clarity and singularity and focus and prioritization. We need a plan. And I just, I'm, I'm, I'm astounded and appalled that we're still making these mistakes right now uh, in the US when we have the ultimate blueprints in the Spanish flu. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned South Africa. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly glad I'm here at the moment. I mean, I'm proud to say that Cyril Ramaphosa, the president, has stepped forward. He took clear guidance early on and he made a stand. He, he came out early. He gave us clear guidance. This was going to be a, a lockdown. In fact, it was one of the first countries that, that um, instilled a nationwide lockdown as early. And look, we are OK. We don't know the true figures, but we're still under 100 deaths here in South Africa, which is quite remarkable. The problem is, of course, we've got people living in close proximity. A lot of people are living in, you know, so poor socioeconomic conditions. And that's why it's so important in developing nations that there is control from a central point, I believe. Now, it's all very well, you know, the likes of Great Britain and America, you know, which we, they value their freedom, but sometimes we need strong leadership. In fact, this is the time when we do need clear, strong leadership from the top. We all saw uh, what Donald Trump was talking about today. You could see the experts next to him you're almost cringing with some of the information that was coming out. Now, we need, we need somebody to lead from the front and to give us guidance. And I don't know if you know, Joseph, but last night addressed us again here in South Africa and gave us a clear direction of now level so I'm now on level four which allows some business to go back but next week this is but only at a limited rate i mean in terms of our social life we are still in lockdown but i think the majority of respect and understand why the case and i think history is telling us why that should be the case yeah and I, i'm here with dr dean allen and um uh, i should probably take a moment just to share with people you're in the wilderness the wilderness is not exactly the most built up uh, um, metropolis in fact, it, it, it is as it sounds. It's a magnificent place, but it's in the middle of nowhere, so to speak. Um, and I know that we've been uh, dealing with data issues and, and cell phone and Wi-Fi issues. It's funny how we're all connected right now and we have 
unprecedented access to data and communication. Um, and, and, we, and you would think on one hand that this would help us be more informed and more emp empowered and more in the know. Um, and in other cases, like even though we're doing that right now, dealing with some of the technical issues because everybody is online and everybody's using this data uh, at the moment. Um, so it's yeah. just been an interesting, I think, almost um, not a contradiction, but these two forces operating together, which is, you know, the more connected we are, the more strain we put on these pipes uh, and the more pressure uh, that it puts on us too. But, but hopefully uh, the quality of your voice and of this message is getting out. Um, I do want to bring up something that Jan said earlier, um, and I think it's important for people watching to, to be very clear. This is not about politics. This is about leadership, um, and this is about education, and this is about learning from mistakes and never making them again. So, you know, Jan said that he heard a book on the 1918, uh, there was a book on the 1918 pandemic that so moved President George W. Bush, yes, George W. Bush, that he started the U.S.'s largest program to prepare for what would become uh, the next big one. And he became almost obsessed on it, George W. Bush, uh, and began planning for it. So uh, Jan was asking, is this true? And uh, I think you can work out what WTF stands for, what happened to that program. Yes. I, I, certainly, I certainly do know what WTF is, but we're not going to mention that. But um, yeah, you're right. I mean, after we had this discussion earlier when we we're preparing for tonight's show, I went back and had a look. And indeed, George W. Bush uh, became quite interested um, with the Spanish flu, which I think all presidents should do. They should look at the past and learn from learn you know, how to deal with the present and the future. So in a post 9-11 world in 2005, um, he came up with the Bush plan, as it were, and it was the national strategy for pandemics. Um, so the much maligned George W. Bush, but I think he actually did a lot of good. And perhaps, you know, we, we maybe look to his leadership right now. But he, he put aside over a billion dollars for this plan. And if we fast forward to Barack Obama in 2014, he maintained that strategy. In fact, it was the, the swine flu outbreak um, that, that led him to realize how, how important this was. So he put together he put together a plan uh, which he implement, implemented within 11 days of, of, of the swine flu outbreak which is interesting so they were really effective now fast forward now to what's been happening of course our present uh, president of the united states he decided to chuck all that out the window so he decided not to follow that strategy um, and he decided to ignore the you know stockpiles of personal protective equipment and things like that. And he ordered states to provide their own. So in other words, he passed the buck on to the individual states. Now, Bush and Obama, albeit from different political um, spheres, as it were, agreed on one thing. Something as important as a national pandemic should be controlled at a, at a national level. So we're not seeing that at the moment with America. So let Let's hope, and God forbid, we don't get a, a, a return to what happened, say, in Philadelphia and those cities that ignored um, ignored the warnings. Yeah, and I, look, and, I, and, and I'm going to ask the, the obvious question, but I feel like I want to state it because I want to be clear about this. Are you responding, and is your response, as, as a supporter or a detractor of the current president, or, or is what you're saying from the perspective of a historian listen i want to take politics out of this discussion i think something as important as this i mean everything is political don't get me wrong but this is from the perspective of having informed information as i said we're doomed to repeat the past if we do not learn from it and that's exactly why i believe someone like myself i mean i'm a trained historian I'm, i gather information and i build up an argument you may agree or not agree with what i'm saying at the moment but i believe true leaders do look to the past to actually inform what they do today and that's that's what we what we're doing this evening as you as you can see here there are many similarities between covid-19 and the spanish flu and if we only look at that we can learn because there are those similarities would you like me to go through these joseph or do you want to pick out particular points yeah you know i i put them up because i think that that you know in terms of coming up with a point of view and, and some clarity i think it's important to think about what they had in common and what makes them different. Because what people are looking for right now, uh, answers. We're looking for answers. 
We're looking for something that we can hold on to, that we can sink our teeth into, that will allow us to believe that there is hope. Um, and and I, I heard a quote yesterday, actually, at a memorial service, at a Zoom memorial service, um, that said, um, if, hope does, if hope does not follow death, then death has been in vain. So if death brings us hope, mm. then hope is what will steer us forward and to the future. And so that's why I thought we would just briefly look at some of these similarities, because there are a lot of similarities, but I'd rather us focus on the differences and see if there is some good news, because we, we certainly need it. Um, I think the only thing I would ask you about here, Dean, is this idea of the second wave and the third wave and the fear that we might have that those waves might be even more destructive and damaging versus will we be prepared globally to handle and to be better prepared for these waves? Well, that, that is the big question. I'm a doctor of history, not a doctor of medicine. Um, so I can't go into the science behind it, but there is an idea that this virus may mutate as it, as it, as it emerges. What we do know is it needs hosts to survive. So that's why we're isolated. That's why we keep our distance from each other. We want this virus almost to die within us before it can be spread. We saw in um, 1918 and going on to 1920 was three distinct waves, actually. I mean, the first, first wave was when it was, when it was discovered in, in, in um, spring 1918. It then went on into the fall of 1918. But then we had another wave um, in, in 1919. Because, as I said, there wasn't a coordinated effort, I believe, and different countries, of course, had different resources. It's probably one of the questions you're going to ask me, but the Western powers, uh, Great Britain, America, etc., clearly had more, more resources to actually put towards this. The greatest number of deaths was actually in India. That doesn't surprise you, I'm sure. 10 million people, a conservative estimate, maybe 18 million people actually lost their lives because of um, the Spanish flu in India. And, but to, uh, one, uh, we don't want this to be all doom and gloom, but I just want to give you a statistic which is quite incredible. Do you know that the Spanish flu killed more people in the first 25 weeks than HIV AIDS has killed in 25 years. We cannot say the same, thankfully, about the coronavirus, even though we've got these shocking figures that you've just showed us earlier, 50,000 unnecessary deaths. It's still not on the scale of the Spanish flu. And as I said, mankind got through the Spanish flu. It got through the Black, the, the, the black Death and the plague and smallpox. It got through two world wars, so we will come through this. I believe that in terms of what we need to do, though, is look at what the effective places, a place like Seattle, for example, I showed you, they, they, the, the protective equipment was, was mandatory. Um, they, they banned social gatherings and they got control of this within their municipality pretty early, whereas mm. other places didn't. And that's, yeah. that's I think, the, the, key, the key point here in terms of um, similarities or differences. Right. In terms of differences, I know you want to focus on that. Well, I was just going to say, when we look at these differences, I put them on screen, I let people kind of peruse their eyes. I want to tell people that are watching right now, if you have a question uh, for Dr. Dean Allen, please put it in the comment uh, thread and, and I'll try and ask, uh, ask it in, in the moments that we have left. Um, but from my perspective, and then I'll hand it back to you, um, I see good news in the sense because the bad news is when we, when we look at the number of deaths from the Spanish flu, it is inconceivable. But I remain hopeful that we have the science and we have the medical expertise and we have the miracles of the intellect of this world together to figure out how to come together. So, so many of the things that you have on this chart give me hope and provide hope that we're, that, that we're not where we were all the way back uh, 100 years ago. No, certainly. And that is, that is the key point. We are one of the things I've made on that point. Science and the treatment techniques, of course, are far more advanced now in 2020. I mean, for example, to put it in, into context, they didn't even have penicillin 
at mm. the outbreak of the of the Spanish flu in 1918. I mean, obviously that doesn't cure this, but it, it would it would help with secondary infections, etc. So we're now at a place where we can understand because we've got those lessons from the past. Perhaps the the, the difference that I'd like to focus on just briefly here. People always ask me well, what what age group was affected. We've heard that there was young people and it was. Would you believe the main difference was the largest death rate occurred in the age group between 18 and 45? Well, we know now that it's actually our elderly population that suffer most. Well, there's there's various strains of thought behind this. But um, as you can see, 66 percent of all deaths in that in that young age group. Well, remember that the younger people were affected by the war in terms of malnutrition, in terms of fighting, in terms of cl close proximity. But interestingly enough, and this will give us hope, they say that a lot of older people survived the Spanish flu because they had lived through the 1890 Russian flu, which killed one million people worldwide. And there's a sense that uh, the elderly people who survived that flu actually built up a, an immunity. Now, I know our scientists at the moment are working on vaccines as we speak. Let's hope they've even got one. But in terms of building up our own immunity, that is how we are going to move forward, whether it's herd immunity or individual immunity. But by getting this virus and actually surviving it, there's a train of thought that this is actually going to beat it. So if you look at the span flu um, in terms of the, how it affected, it affected society in different ways. And by the way, how about this for a stat? Three million orphans were created as a result of the Spanish flu because younger people, parents were the ones that suffered. Well, I mean, incredible. I, I think you're certainly making me feel better about the situation because because uh, I feel like we definitely, our, our, our uh, brothers and sisters 100 years ago had a bit of a tougher time. Um, but I, I, I thought it would be good to um, pull this quote up, right? We're in a much better place to handle pandemic than we were 100 years ago, as I was saying. And you know what, you can take it from Joseph Jaffe, the host of Corona TV, or you can take it from someone who actually knows what they're talking about. We are in a better place. But let me ask you this question. Why don't we feel it? Why don't we feel like we're in a better place? Why do we feel at times so lost and confused um, and scared? Why? Well, well, we're all in that position. It, this, this, this virus affects everyone, absolutely everyone, regardless of your wealth, your status, your ethnic background I and mean, when we saw the, the the prime minister of great britain in intensive care the other week i mean this this is is something that affects us not just only physically, of course and mentally I and mean, it's quite a thing to lose our routine to lose perhaps what we live for which is our family connections and our job and to actually be be isolated a lot of us unfortunately on our own I hope you are with your loved one, but people aren't. And of course, that is going to is going to feel strange. And there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that. So I believe another thing that we have to be very, very careful of is, is our mental health at this this um, at this juncture. A lot of people are, are are starting to ask very big questions about the future, what is going to happen, and it is a, it is a scary thing. It's an unprecedented an unprecedented situation we find ourselves in because let's face it in this in this era of communication we turn on the tv we put on our laptop and we think we're informed but i think for the first time we realize how vulnerable we are as a human race how yeah. the planet actually is the one in control how we are now sitting back and we're having to take stock of where we are in our lives and it's a philosophical point i make here but i believe that to, to move forward I hope there is going to be some changes for the good. And it's easy to say, of course, if you've got that bank balance and, you, and, you're, and you're getting through this, a lot of people are really struggling. And those are the people we've got to support when we come out of this. Because we will come out of this, there's no doubt. But there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that we all feel strange at the moment. It's such an important point that you made about the fact that we, we have been felled you know, as, 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 as a race, as a human race, we have been reminded that we are not in control uh, anymore. And, and Greg just said, it's high time we have serious truth and straight talk discussions. That's it. We've got to be able to tell the truth and talk the truth and, and acknowledge the truth. We don't need to sugarcoat or candy coat um, and, and create a false narrative. We've got to get real and we've got to get honest. And it's only through that honesty that we can actually figure out a way uh, to pull through. So Greg asked, um, and I'm, I'm going to have this as the last question, and then we're going to move over to, uh, to the Zoom room. 
and and I certainly hope you guys will come and join us and then ask these questions directly. So, uh, Dean, do you want to answer this question now or do you want to answer it in the Zoom room? What uh, do you do? You think we find a vaccine in the next two to three years, and and the impact will be the search for a vaccine have on the lockdown? As as I said, I hope hope the scientists have actually are actually have got a vaccine now. I mean, you know what it's like in in, in society. We have to test these things. I saw me only earlier today. There are trials taking place now. So we're going to fast forward to this. I believe there there will be a vaccine for this this form. But remember. Um, and the conspiracy theorists will, will say, well, that, that's obvious. It won't be the last pandemic we face. And in, perhaps in another hundred years, the pattern will be repeated. Now, what I will, will stress is I hope, that we have, I hope that we have structures and leaders in place that actually learn from, from and, and know that the right thing to do is perhaps what we've done here in Africa. That put life before profits and we close down and we make sure that everybody is secure and then we move forward from that point. And I think that's that's the key from this. And I hope if, if you've I know it's a serious subject to talk about on a Friday night, ladies and gentlemen, but I hope if you if you found any comfort from what I've said, you can see from the statistics that we have a lot worse than this. I mean, we're talking 100 years ago. We've been through two world wars. We've been through the HIV pandemic, swine flu and things like this. So it's not the first time kind of has faced this challenge. It just feels strange for us at the moment because we, we've lost our sense of control. So to answer the question, I hope certainly within two years we'll have a vaccine for this, but it doesn't mean we're going to eradicate unless... We change our behaviors, we're going to eradicate future pandemics breaking out. I'm um, going to uh, let you uh, have the final word. Um, I'm just trying to also process. I think, I think those, those are amazing words, uplifting words, powerful words. Um, and I just appreciate you and I appreciate your time uh, today. Um, we're going to move over to the Zoom room. If I recall, I've just changed it. It's bit.ly bit uh, slash, I think it's Corona TV after show, or you can use uh, some of the old uh, URLs. You guys know this. If you have a look at the bottom over there, you can see how to get into the Zoom room. But more importantly, um, if you want to uh, find out more about uh, Dr. Dean Allen, go to deanallen.co.za or ZA, as we say here in the US. If you want to register for his webinar, bit.ly slash Dean Allen, and it's going to be on Monday. Um, you know, I keep hearing this stuff, it doesn't get old. In fact, I'm learning something new every time. I want to thank you so much uh, for your time, for your wisdom, uh, for your generosity, uh, and for sharing this with, with the world today. So, Dean, last few words are yours, my friend. Well, Joseph, thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute privilege, and it's and it, I feel I feel the energy through the screen. As you said, I'm sitting here at the at the bottom tip of Africa here um, on my cell phone. Uh, I know it probably looks quite a professional setup. We're doing this, uh, you know, through the powers of kind of technology. But um, I'm glad we got through this evening. But I just wanted to say to everybody, please, please be strong. Please uh, keep your spirits up. Um, Better times will come. We will soon be back into those into those family gatherings and to go to our favorite pub and our sports venues and our concerts. But let's not rush this. Let's make sure that uh, life, when it does come back to some sense of normal, is a better form of life. I think that's my my wish. And 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 thank you for thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. And um, Joseph, what you're doing is is magnificent. And uh, and I'll be tuning into Corona TV most evenings to get this day this daily dose of, of wisdom and. Uh, and upliftment, actually. So thank you. That's awesome. And uh, for those of you that uh, are about to move over, uh, Corona TV will uh, be back on Sunday. I'm going to do a little potpourri on Sunday, answering your questions, being a little bit more interactive and more relaxed, talking about what's on my mind. Um, I, I just can't stay away for too long. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, those of you that won't be back on Sunday, otherwise, I'll see you all on Monday, and I'll see some of you in the Zoom room in just a few moments. Take care. Thank you again, Dean. Thank you. Pleasure.